try to answer them. Just read them and then I'll attempt to answer. Okay, the first question is, can you please establish the Holy Spirit as a person, as God, by the word of God, if it does indeed exist? All right, before we attempt to answer, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we answer these questions, please direct us, grant us insight, teach us your word, and whoever sent the question, Father, give them a heart to accept the truth. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a lot of controversy about the Holy Spirit, even in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Is the Holy Spirit a person? Is the Holy Spirit equal to the Father? Adventists believe, yes, He is. Not it is, He is. The Holy Spirit is as fully God as is the Son and the Father. Now, in the Trinity, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One plus one plus one equals one. That's divine math. One plus one plus one. There are three gods. There's one God. The same way in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, where God said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they, how many? Two shall be what? One flesh. So if it's a mystery to you, if it's no mystery how two people can be one family, it's no mystery how three entities can be one God. Now, there are two things about God that he uses to establish his divinity. And the number one is the fact that he created the other one is, he knows the end from the beginning. Let's go to Isaiah, I think it's 46. I'm guessing here, let's see it's 46. Who has a Bible? Isaiah 46, let's try verses 9 and 10. Who has it? Okay, read nice and loud. Right, stand up, stand up, stand up. Handsome brother, stand up, all right. Remember the former things of old? And there is... Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Pause. Keep standing. God is saying, look, there's no one like me. Do you understand? There is no God like me. Here's one reason. Declaring. Yes. And from ancient times. Okay, thank you. Now, here's what God, thank you very much. God says, look, one of the reasons there is no other God like me, I know the end from the beginning. I say things will happen long before they happen. Now let's go to First Peter. Chapter 1. Someone else stand up and read for us. First Peter chapter 1. In this passage we're about to read, Peter is trying to show that the gospel he preached and Paul preached had been prophesied years before by the holy prophets. Uh, let's read from verse 9. Who has it? First Peter 1, reading from verse 9. Someone stand up. Yes, my dear sister Michelle, stand up and read. Of your soul. Okay, pause, meaning the purpose of faith is salvation. Oh, don't sit my delightful sister, stand up. The end of faith is salvation, not the finishing of faith. The word end means the object. That's why the Bible says Christ is the end of the law. Not the termination, the object. The point of the law is to point you to Jesus. So the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Verse 10, of which salvation? Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and Who are the prophets? Who are the prophets? What is a prophet? A person who, yes, speaks for God. All right. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently? Yes, now, who prophesied of the grace that should come. What are they doing? Prophesying, give me another word. Predicting. They are prophesying of the grace that should come. It has not yet come. Now the prophets are prophesying. Go on. Mm -hmm. Stop, stop. You see, the prophets, when they were receiving revelations, they did not fully understand what they were writing. But they tried hard. Notice verse 11. Searching what, or what manner of time, the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, go on and the glories that should follow. Pause. Now, the spirit revealed to the prophets, unto whom it was revealed, go on. Mm -hmm. But unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by those that have preached the gospel uh -huh. unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, heaven which things the angels now thank you. Now you look at verse eleven again. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified. What's the next word? What does beforehand mean? What does beforehand mean? Then what is the passage saying about the Spirit of Christ and the Apostles? 
in the prophets. It was telling them long before what would happen. Now, God said in Isaiah 46 verse 10, that is what makes me God. Peter makes it clear, the Holy Spirit does the same thing. Now, look at verse 12 said, with the Holy Ghost come down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now, the gospel is such a mystery, the angels do not fully understand it. Notice that they preach it with the Holy Ghost. Now we have the Holy Ghost comes sent down from heaven. The angels are from heaven, but the angels don't understand it. The Holy Ghost does. Are you following me? The Holy Ghost does. Because only Father, Son, and Holy Ghost fully understand the gospel. Now, that's the ability to predict. The Holy Ghost can do that. Now, let's go to Isaiah... Let's go to Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10. We look at creation as an expression of divinity. Creation is proof that the creator is God. Jeremiah 10, let's read verses 11 and 12. Someone else stand up and read. Ah, we're in the back. Nice and loud. Verse 11, verse uh, 11 and 12 of Jeremiah 10. Yes. That's right. Shall perish from the earth. Pause before you read verse 12. Don't sit, stay standing. God tells Jeremiah, Thus shall ye say to them, The gods that have not made, in other words, they cannot create. God is distinguishing himself. I am the true God because I can create. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Now listen to verse 12. He hath made the earth by his power. That's right. He hath established the world by his wisdom. Uh-huh. Stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Thank you very much. Now, this is creation. God can do that. That's why he's God. Now let's go to Psalm 104. Someone else jump up. Psalm 104. We establish the Holy Spirit as God. Psalm 104. Someone else jump up, please. Go on, Dr. Bless, come on. Psalm 104, read from verse 29. Mm-hmm. Listen carefully. Were well, you right here with me? Oh, okay. 29, right? Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Mm-hmm. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. What the psalmist is saying about the natural world, the animal kingdom, when God turns away from the animal kingdom, they're confused. When he takes away their breath, they die. Listen to verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. Yes, thou sendest forth whom? Thy spirit, they are created. The spirit was involved in creation. God can create. The spirit creates. God can tell the future. The spirit tells the future. The Holy Spirit is as divine as the Father and as the Son. Next question. That, that's one reason. That's one. Mm, just one. Just. Yes, yes. But Paul says, everything the Father knows, the Spirit knows. First Corinthians 2. Everything the Father knows, the Spirit knows. Yes. As in his human form, he didn't know. Yes. The human Jesus was limited. That's why we're told in Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. He increased, he grew. Ellen White tells us that his mother had to tell him, you see that flower? You made it. He said, really? Yeah, you made it. (laughs) He didn't know. Isn't that amazing? He had to learn. You see that star? Yeah, you made it. Me? Yeah. All right. Amen. The second question. Can Holy Spirit be called angel based on Hebrew 1 verse 14? Someone read Hebrew 1 14. Can the Holy Spirit be called an angel? Hebrews 1.14, someone jump up again athletically and read Hebrews 1. Okay, Dr. Bless. Okay, <laughs> Janwa, Janwa, Janwa Stern, Janwa Stern. Yes, Janwa. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto them who shall be heirs of salvation? The word spirits there refers to angels, not to the Holy Ghost. Sometimes the word spirits refers to people, 
Let me show you that. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. So you cannot call the Holy Ghost an angel. He's not an angel. The only member of the Godhead who's ever appeared as an angel is Jesus Christ. Because he's the commander of the angels, and sometimes he takes on the form of an angel, the same way he's our savior, and he took on the form of a human being. Do we have First Peter chapter 3? Let's read from verse 18. Well, let my assistant preacher read verse 18 here. For Christ also had once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, he was put to death by the flesh. Quickened how? By the Spirit. Now verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Pause. By which mean by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, verse 18, that raised him up. He went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Who were these spirits in prison? The next verse tells us. Which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. What is Peter talking about? Who were these spirits in prison? The people who were in what kind of prison? Sin. Why Noah was preaching for how many years? The Holy Spirit was convicting their hearts. That's why the Bible says in Genesis 6-3, My spirit shall not always strive with man. So this, the word spirits in that verse simply refers to the people back in Noah's day. Spirits in Hebrews 1.14 refers to angels, not the Holy Ghost. He's a spirit, yes, but he's not an angel. Next question. Okay, with the question, if I didn't yield to the temptation, is it still okay? Must I be accountable for the sin of others, such as thieves or homosexual and cast stones? It's hard to... It's hard to understand how we should stay away from those who sin. Nobody is perfect. Therefore, how can we, all ch children of God, look down on one another for sin? We're not accountable for other sins unless we contribute to their committing of that sin. Now, God never calls upon us to look down on people. He calls upon us to look down on sin. There's a tremendous difference. We must love people and see how God sees them. When God sees you and he sees Jesus, God sees you as valuable. That's how we must see people. Now, we must hate what they do. God does not hate people, God hates sin. When God comes, he's coming to destroy sin. It is a tragedy, he'll find that sin in people. God doesn't hate people, he hates sin. Jesus died to save people, he didn't die to save sin. He died to save them from their sin. So we must not agree with lifestyles that offend God. Homosexuality offends God. Lesbianism offends God. Adultery offends God. Fornication offends God. Having six wives offends Him. Having six husbands offends Him. Hate the behavior, not the person. Are you following me? Alright. Okay, the next question. Does Satan live during the millennium or is it raised at the second resurrection? Satan lives during the millennium. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, reading from verse 1. And we read that this morning during the sermon. Who is that strong man? Dr. Bless, get up and read for us. From verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Continue. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. And bound him a thousand years. All right. Thank you very much. Verse 2 says that this angel that came down from heaven, he laid hold on the serpent, which is the dragon, which is the devil, and killed him. Why do you look at me so puzzled? Is that what the Bible said? What does the Bible say the angel did? It bound, didn't kill him. It bound him and cast him into the bottom of the pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. And what the angel took away was his ability to deceive because there's no one else alive. He could not deceive. Now look at verse, let's read verse 7. Verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be raised from the grave. What does the verse say? He shall be loose out of his where do you keep dead people? In prison? No. He is alive. Prison does not affect a dead man. 
Part of the imprisonment for Satan must is part of his suffering. So he is alive for a thousand years, but in prison, the Bible says, after the thousand years, he is loose. You can't lose a dead man. He isn't raised, he is loose. So the devil is alive during the thousand years. Yes, he is. But has no one to tempt. Can you say amen? <laughs> Quickly. Read it, read it for us, read it for us, my good brother, Isaiah 14, 90 to 20. Someone read it, someone read it. Bible students can find these verses very quickly. Yes, okay, January. Isaiah 14, 90 to 20. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as a raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under, under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. All right, thank you. Shall not be joined with them in burial. All the wicked are dead, but Satan does not join them. He stays alive. All right, next question. We have to let God's saints go. It's 5.30. Next question. Okay. Dear Pastor Skeet, I was reading this thought from an SDA author this morning. said that I would like to know what the Bible really says about it. A Christian must guard against the two fallacies. The first one, the idea that we need to add some things of our own to God's grace. And the second, freedom in Christ frees us from obedience to His claims. Alright, we can't add anything to God's grace, that's right. We can't add anything to God's salvation, that's right. But let me tell you something. In order to be saved, there's something you need to do. Notice I said, in order for God to save you. In order for God to do the 100% work of saving me, there's something I need. What I need to do is not saving myself. It is letting God know that I want to be saved with all my heart. Now, let's read the most popular verse in the world, John 3.16. Say it with me. For God so loved the world, the whole world, that He gave His only begotten Son. Stop. What do you understand by God so loved the world? Is it just uh, Bloomington or just Upland or just Loma Linda? Everybody. And God gave Jesus to everybody. Now, the verse now makes a distinction. That whosoever... Uh Aha. Who has to believe you or Jesus? Whosoever believeth. To believe God's word is to accept it for what it says. There's another word for that. What's that? Faith? What's that? Obey. That's a word that the sinful nature does not like. Have you ever told someone, move? The person said, why are you talking to me like that? Don't talk to me like that. You can't talk. We don't like to get orders. We just don't like orders, even in the military. We hate obey. But what caused Adam and Eve to be cast out of the garden? Disobedience. What will get them back in? Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right. You can't add anything to God's grace. But you can let God see you're ready for salvation to work in your life to the point of changing you. You made no contribution to the gift of Jesus. But you have to act in order for that gift to change your life. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and... Finish the verse. If any man... And... Let's skip the rest. Okay, if God really cares his creation, then why some animals extinct? (laughs) This is a... Some animals are extinct because... uh, One of the reasons, I think, because we have the sinful nature. The sinful nature is very bloodthirsty. We have to kill something. Some people just have to kill something. Now, many Christians don't realize that the breath of life in a human being is the same breath of life in an animal. The Bible says that. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. When the story of the flood is told in Genesis 7 verse 21, the Bible says, And every living substance, every creature was destroyed which moved upon the the earth. Verse 21. Both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of man, All, verse 22, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Man, fowl, cattle, beast, 
Bird. Same breath of life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 19. That which befalleth the sons of men, befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath. We have to understand that. Human beings don't understand how close we are to being animals. What separates us from animals is not that our breath is any different. God put into us the capacity to build a character. And you have seen how people can behave in times of disaster and stress. When godliness goes out the window and animal behavior takes over. Now, when you understand that the life in you, the breath in you is the breath in that deer, you think twice about pointing a rifle and killing it for no other reason than just to kill it. To put the head on your wall. You think twice about hooking a fish, ripping the mouth, taking out the hook, throwing it back with a smile. <laughs> Next question. Finally, Pastor Skeet, I've been thinking about being baptized, but I keep falling into sin. I want to give my life to the Lord, but I don't think my life is living up to its standards. My question is, is baptism of the water needed? Baptism of the Holy Spirit is more Im more important, but but do I have to be baptized in water? Was Jesus baptized in water, yes or no? Yes. If anyone had the Holy Spirit, it was Jesus. How many sins did Jesus commit? You know what Jesus told John the Baptist? Let's go to Matthew chapter 3 very quickly. Let's read from verse, uh, verse 14. Verse 13. Matthew 3, reading from verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy Voice, so I had you to go on and on. But Matthew chapter 3, verse 13... I'll let you find it. It's okay. We're nice people. Come on, say amen. All right. You have it now? All right. Okay. Okay. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him. Now, what does forbade mean? He said no. John the Baptist said no. Saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? 
And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Yes. Jesus says, look, I have to do every righteous thing in my life. One of those righteous things is to be baptized. And if you don't baptize me, you will contribute to my not fulfilling one item. It becometh us. Not only is it righteous for me to be baptized, it's also righteous for you to baptize me. Notice he said, it becometh us. It is a tremendous act of righteousness when the pastor puts you under that water. It is an act of righteousness when you obey and you say, Lord, I will be baptized as Jesus was. Yes, we need water baptism. Water baptism doesn't convert you. It's an expression of your obedience. It doesn't have to make sense. All you need to know is God said, do it, and we do it. Let's stand. Anything else needs to be said before I pray, Pastor? No? Can I just? Okay. Father in heaven, thank you for your people here at Upland Indonesian Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for their presence during the week. Father, I believe in their hearts is a desire to serve you, to love you, but we all have struggles. I ask you from my heart, work with every member, every father, mother, son, daughter, friend, cousin, uncle, grandmother, granddaughter, niece, nephew, friend. Bless each member, dear God. Let the Spirit of Christ be seen in this church at Sabbath school, Wednesday night prayer meeting, board meetings, business meetings, potlucks. Whenever they come together, let the angels rejoice that godly people are coming together. Remove sin from our lives. Fill our hearts with love. Fill our hearts with righteousness. Fill us with holiness and make us more like Jesus with each passing day. And Father, when you come with your Son and all the holy angels, save every member of this church with all the friends I ask. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you.